And this should be rather lovely. So welcome to Tessa, Susie, and Lucy. <laughs> Thank you very much, Derek. I'm going to very informally chair this all, just sort of, if we run out of things to say, which I suspect we won't, having talked together in preparation, <laughs> I'll think of something else to put into the mix. And I think we'll talk together for about three quarters of an hour, 50 minutes, and then we'll open it up to you with questions and hope you have some interesting ones about reading and writing for us. And it seemed the obvious place to begin by talking about childhood, actually, because certainly that tends to be where reading and a passion for reading begins. As I, as I formulated that to myself in preparation for the event, I did ask the question, I wonder if there are readers who actually don't read for 20 years and then discover it as a great... Uh, somebody's put their hand up, so isn't that <laughs> also a lovely story? And I haven't asked the other two, so it may be their story. I, I suspect not, but maybe we should actually hear from you at the end and you can tell us well. So, uh, Lucy, let's start with you and then we'll all talk about it. Tell us about your childhood reading and what kind of a reader you are and what it meant to you. <laughs> OK, well, I grew up in the country in a fairly isolated part of rural England, and Oxfordshire, not the back of beyond, but we were sort of two miles from the nearest village. There weren't a lot of other children around. I have two brothers, but one's quite a lot younger than me, and the other one went away to boarding school when I was five. And so he wasn't around much of the time. And I did spend hours and hours and hours of every day, I think, reading. And then even when, once I started going to school and there were other people around, I was a rather shy, uh, tongue-tied, greasy-haired, spectacle-wearing girl. And um, I think being rather unpopular as a teenager is very, very good mm. for somebody who wants to be a writer. <laughs> <laughs> So I, di I did read a lot, and I started off with some rather strange books. My mother had a wonderful collection, which I suppose was really uh, her mother's or even her grandmother's books, um, of sort of Victorian children's books, which were all deeply moralistic. And the, the stories would... I mean, a typical one might be a little boy who'd been absolutely forbidden to go into the field with the bull, he looks over the fence, he sees his baby sister being gored by the bull. What should he do? Should he climb over the fence, disobeying his, his nanny, uh, leaving his poor little sister to be, you know, uh, killed, kill, killed, that's the word I'm looking for? Or should he bravely and heroically disobey the rules like Lord Nelson did and um, go and, and be the, do the valiant thing? So... Uh, is, you know, they were rather odd books for me to be reading, I think. But I feel that <laughs> offers so much more for the imagination <laughs> than the slightly milk and water books that kids often read now, where it's like children's daily lives. Shall we have fish and chips for tea? Let's go with Daddy to the museum. Charlie throws spaghetti on the floor. Surely, yes. Bulls, death, moral <laughs> heroism, <laughs> religious Ethical dilemmas. dilemmas. <laughs> exactly. And certainly my mother... Um, would, she was very much against, I don't, I don't think the phrase young adult existed at that time, but the idea of books that were written for sort of older children and adolescents. By the time you could read, really, you could start reading proper books, mm. was her idea. Mm. So I, I, I moved on from The Little Boy and the Bull to start reading um, The Count of Monte Cristo was a great favourite when I was sort of nine, ten, that sort of age. And I also used to, I had a, a, an uncle who was quite a lot younger than my parents who would come and stay most weekends and he was a bit sort of groovy and he would bring <laughs> the kind of books that maybe my parents weren't reading. And I would sneak into the spare room on a weekday when he wasn't around and read these slightly risque books that he'd have left behind. And I can remember reading Aldous Huxley's Eyeless in Gaza, which probably isn't much read nowadays, but it opens, the, the, it, 
the, as far as I remember, it's many, many years since I've read it, the first scene has a, a man and a woman on a flat roof, and the woman, and this seems to me very uh, sort of dashing and sophisticated, was wearing a pair of orange silk pajamas. So they're up on the roof, orange silk pajamas, and when an aeroplane passes over and a dog falls out of the aeroplane, splat onto the roof, dead, um, I thought this was riveting. But I'd, it was actually probably 20 years before I reread Eilis in Gaza and realized that what the man and the woman were doing on the roof was, was having sex. But as a child... It would be the dog from I'm the aeroplane. Far more interested in the dog. Brilliant. <laughs> Susie, what about you? I was very stage struck as a child, so most of the books I read were um, set in ballet schools or um, drama schools or, um, or in the world of the theatre. And I particularly loved the books of Noel Stratfield, and I found that she was in the telephone directory, so I rang her up one evening. <laughs> and... Um, and, and she answered the phone saying, Miss Streetfield. So obviously it's pronounced Streetfield because she would know, wouldn't she? <laughs> and, um, and I said, oh, I, I just ring to say I really love your work. And she said, do you have a favourite? And I said, yes, I think that would be ballet shoes. Anyway, goodbye. <laughs> 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 but, but I was really glad to have done that. And I even wrote a continuation of ballet shoes when I was at primary school called Ballet Boots, which I can, <laughs> <laughs> I can hardly believe now. And in fact, my report that term said that I was doing very well in, well in English, but it was a shame that all my creative writing was set in the dance world. And my teacher then gave me a copy of Jane Eyre. And I was probably nine or 10, which I can't remember how old Jane Eyre is at the beginning of Jane Eyre, but it's quite something reading it when you're of her age when she's going through children are so um, attuned to any kind of injustice and obviously that's one of Jane Eyre's leading characteristics in a way and so feeling what she was going through at a sort of similar age was incredibly powerful and then I became really obsessed with reading I think I didn't understand my life at all none of it made any sense to me and I knew that I wanted more life in my life than I had but I knew that the life available to me was a, was a bit too scary so books really solved that problem and I could just yeah. I really wanted to I suppose have more adventures without quite having to have them so it really solved that that problem for me and I remember if I was on the last chapter of a book I'd have another one underneath it so that when it finished I could go straight into the next one and that was very comforting. Yeah. Yeah. I can actually remember that feeling of closing one and and it, as if a portal closes and you're sort of returned back in yourself but having the next one yeah. to open and reading five library books a week that kind of thing yeah does make me think that thing lucy said to start off with that maybe readers real passionate readers are quite weird people <laughs> and and then maybe those people become writers <laughs> and so maybe writers are quite weird people and and in a way the novel tradition as we have had it here over the last couple of hundred years, is sort of, it, it's made and consumed by people who are quite marginal, who, who are that teenager you say you were, Lucy, which is hard to believe, you <laughs> I know, don't with believe. the greasy hair and the glasses, with, with not the many <laughs> friends, or the little anxious streamer who wants to be a ballet dancer. What do you two think about that? Because it, it doesn't feel like that to us. It doesn't feel like a report from the margins. It feels as if it is the heart of life, doesn't it? Well, I was definitely the youngest of a large family and was convinced that all the personality types had already been taken, so <laughs> I was desperate to be heard in some way, so that mm. definitely plays into it. Yeah, and my brother was a football... I, you know, good at football, sporting, with a perpetual gang of admiring friends, and so that, again, you do choose a niche, don't you? You, you take that niche. Yes, and I think, what Susie, what you said about wanting more lives, other lives, is, um, is so important. Because actually, if the only life we live is the one yes. we're actually visibly yeah. living in our bodies, yeah. we know what an impoverished existence that is. You want to, yeah. If you're a reader, you can live thousands of lives mm. in your lifetime. You can enter mm. so many different conscien consciousnesses, the consciousness of the authors and also of the fictional characters. And then, of course, once you get to write yourself, then you're also living inside the minds of the people you're writing about. And to, I mean, you know, even if you had a, a much more exciting life than mine's ever been, 
<laughs> one, one life isn't one enough. One life isn't enough. And that's what Jane Eyre is thinking, isn't she? She sits there with Buick's birds open on her lap, looking at the illustrations of the far-off mountains. I think it's Greenland that she's looking at, or, or some idea of Greenland. She's doing exactly what you've just described. In fact, in her case, to get away from a, a miserable life where she's overlooked. But she can... It's compensatory. I think it's a shame that reading isn't sort of el considered illicit anymore. There was a, you were saying you shot yourself in a room to do it or the thing of people doing it yeah. late at night slightly disgracefully. Yeah. And I worked in a bookshop for quite a long time when I was a teenager and we weren't supervised on Sunday. So I just used to go, go into the basement and read all the books and, because why wouldn't I? But I felt yeah. I was being a bit wicked and that yeah. gave it more yeah. panache. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and like Lucy, I stumbled as a child, on Victorian literature, which probably parents innocently thought would be you know, worthy. And the sensation novels, I, I read East Lynn, and I couldn't quite work out what was going on. It was adultery, but it had an aura of such glamour and drama, and I knew, I knew something was up. So, so this, this diet was very rich, and adults didn't always know what extraordinary dramatic stuff you were reading. You know, what is it happens in East Lynn where the governess is really the wife who ran off with another man, comes back, she's supposed to be dead, and is governess to her own children. One of them dies. I mean, it's, it's great. It's, it's quite, it, it raises one's appetite for grandeur. And there's that very useful fallacy that books about children are suitable for children to read. Mm. So I mean, we've already mm -hmm. mentioned Jane Eyre several times, I imagine we may yeah. continue to do so because it's such an influential book. But so uh, young girls especially are often given Jane Eyre to read. Uh, similarly, David Copperfield, because David's very young when the book starts, similarly Great Expectations. Um, these aren't children's books, mm. but hooray, children get to yeah. read them yeah. Yeah. because of that sort of mistaken notion uh, and there's a sort of, I think, not quite such a good principle that books about animals are good for children. So wretched children who know absolutely nothing about the Russian Revolution find themselves ploughing through Animal Farm, having not a clue what it's about. But uh, yeah, it's about animals, of course. <laughs> <laughs> we all said today that we would bring along, we're going to do, we're going to all read a little bit from our own writing so that you can see what became of all this strangeness when we were young. But we also said we would bring along just a very short paragraph or, in Susie's case, a short poem by some writer we loved, something we loved, a piece of writing that just is it. Uh, Lucy, do you want to start? OK, well, as I say, we've already talked about Jane Eyre and nothing wrong with that. It's an absolutely wonderful book. But Charlotte Bronte actually wrote an even better book, which is not so popular, Villette, uh, which is my absolute desert island book. And this is a passage from it. The narrator is Lucy Snow, who um, has, is working. She, she's a sort of an orphan, a young woman with no family, has to support herself, and she's taken a job working in a girls' school in the town she calls Villette, which is very closely modelled on, on Brussels. Um, and the, the, the head teacher, the proprietor of the school, is a woman called Madame Beck. And Villette is a wonderful love story with two romantic heroes, one of whom turns out to be a, a dead end and the other turns out to be the most attractive man in literature, I think. But this is... That is a, a slightly perverse choice, I should yeah. just put it in. <laughs> <laughs> the, the most severe man in literature. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, he's not in this passage. In this passage, Lucy is watching... The, the third really interesting character whom she encounters in Villette, which is the head teacher, Madame Beck. She has to sleep in a dormitory with the rest of the girls. She has no privacy, as would have been normal for kind of teachers in a boarding school at that time. <laughs> we are having a fabulous time, yeah! <laughs> She'll resume after these messages. <laughs> Maybe it's us he's talking about. <laughs> 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 Undoubtedly. I can't wait. I, 
I mounted the staircase, approached the dormitory, and quietly opened the door, which was always kept carefully shut, and which, like every other door in this house, revolved noiselessly on well-oiled hinges. Before I saw, I felt that life was in the great room, usually void. Not that there was either stir or breath or rustle of sound, but vacuum lacked. Solitude was not at home. All the white beds lay visible at a glance. All were empty. No sleeper reposed therein. The sound of a drawer cautiously slid out struck my ear. Stepping a little to one side, my vision took a free range unimpeded by falling curtains. I now commanded my own bed and my own toilet with a locked workbox upon it and locked drawers beneath. Very good. A dumpy, motherly little body, in decent shawl and the cleanest of possible nightcaps, stood before my dressing table, hard at work, apparently doing me the kindness of tidying out the furniture. Open stood the lid of the workbox, open the top drawer. Duly and impartially was each succeeding drawer opened in turn. Not an article of their contents but was lifted and unfolded, not a paper but was glanced over, not a little box but was unlidded, and beautiful was the adroitness, exemplary the care with which the search was accomplished. Madame wrought at it like a true star, unhasting yet unresting. I will not deny that it was with a secret glee I watched her. Had I been a gentleman, I believe Madame would have found favour in my eyes. She was so handy, neat, thorough in all she did. Some people's movements provoke the soul by their loose awkwardness, hers satisfied by their trim compactness. I stood, in short, fascinated. But it was necessary to make an effort to break this spell. A retreat must be beaten. The searcher might have turned and caught me. There would have been nothing for it then but a scene, and she and I would have had to have come all at once with a sudden clash to a thorough knowledge of each other. Down would have gone conventionalities, away swept disguises, and I should have looked into her eyes and she into mine. We should have known that we could work together no more and parted in this life forever. Where was the use of tempting such a catastrophe? I turned and fled, descending the stairs with progress as swift and soundless as that of the spider, which as the same instant ran down the banister. Oh, isn't that extraordinary, read mm. like that? I think the, the, the passage in which she says that had Madame Beck, or had she been a gentleman, mm. she would have found Madame Beck attractive, is mm. so full of um, complexity. Mm. And the, obviously, mm. the sort of, it has that kind of... And the sentences feel so modern, read like that. Yeah. Solitude was a vacuum lacked. Solitude was not at home. That's, that's mm-hmm. so not Victorian in any way we normally recognise. Well, I think that actually the idea that there is a sort of Victorian traditional yeah. novel yeah. against which the modernists rebelled yeah. is complete nonsense. Yeah, I mean, the earlier back you go in the history of the novel, the more the writers are having to make up the rules as they go yeah. along. Yeah. And this Villette is, um, at a certain point, Lucy Snow has a, kind of, has a kind of mental breakdown, at which point the prose breaks down as well. Mm-hmm. It becomes mm-hmm. so yeah. freaky. And yes. the drugs and yes. Yeah. yes. Yeah. Before we go on to Susie's and my reading, I, that raises this interesting thing about reading and the past. When you read that first as a young girl, you probably didn't have a huge amount of historical context. But there you are reading a book written in uh, eighteen fifty one or something like that. Um, yes. And so talk a bit, Lucy, and then Susie about how one's love of literature and one's love for certain books makes a relationship with the vanished past of our history. Yes, well, I I do think that's very important because um, if you study history in the conventional sense of the word, you find out what happened. Mm. But if you read (coughs) fiction, or indeed non-fiction, written in the past, (coughs) you find out what people thought about what happened, which is often more important and more interesting. So that um, you're entering the mindset of people from the past. And there's a certain school of sort of modern historical fiction 
which tries to say people in the olden days are just like us. They aren't. They no, thought differently. No. But they, you know, it wasn't just mm. they had different clothes. Mm. Their whole sort of mentality was, was differently formed. And I think that... And yet it, approachable. Completely and, approachable. Yes. And fiction does that for us yes. because it takes you right inside their minds. Mm. Mm. Susie, any thoughts about that? that? That pastness of the books one reads and what it does for one? I definitely didn't realise lots of books were set in the past mm. when I read them, or even television programmes, or I just accepted them for what they were, and then... Um, Afterwards, yes. made a framework. Yes, exactly. We were talking earlier about, you know, if a bun cost a quarter of a farthing in 1810, then I would mem I'd remember being very noticing of prices of things and sort of working out what a bicycle would cost or a house and that kind of thing, which is not the way to entertain economics with any authority. <laughs> but uh, I picked up those, I love those sorts of details or the way people cleaned. And then a lot of life in the past was about church, wasn't it? And yeah. so that makes a huge yeah. difference and yeah. that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, should, should I read the bit I was going to read now? Or should well, I was just going to, no, mm. do in a moment. I was just going to add in to what you just said, that when I was a little girl, I think, like you, I didn't actually... I felt as at home with the Edwardian books I read, like the E. Nesbitt books. I've, of course I didn't have a nanny or a cook or live in that kind of household, but it felt so available to me. It felt like it was in the next room. And I... I we need to do that about our past, don't we? Because otherwise everything just vanishes into a dark hole of oblivion. And it's a real kind of ancestor worship. It's our very modern culture's form of keeping the past alive. Well, one of the forms. History, of course, we need to. We really do. But we need to read the literature of the past to, to put us back inside those other mindsets and keep them approachable, keep the doors open into that next room. And, and also perhaps to remind ourselves that, you know, there's nothing new under the sun. Yeah. So, you know... And this passes too. We, we think yeah. that we in you know, the last generation or two have invented feminism. Nonsense. Uh, you know, the, the more you read, the more you realise that um, every thought we have ha has a backstory and a tradition. Yeah. yeah. So now, whiz <laughs> forward to the mid-20th century, Susie. <laughs> Daring. Um, I'm reading a sonnet by the poet John Berryman, who's a great love of mine, and I discovered um, when I shouldn't have been um, reading books at the bookshop downstairs. And I then talked about it to my dad, who turned out to be a big fan of his as well. And in fact, he read this poem to me on the telephone. And it's a sonnet that was written in the 50s, but not published, I think, till the late 60s, because it was about a love affair, and he was married at the time. And so a um, certain amount of time had to pass. And it's a sonnet which is about an argument. And it's an argument between two people who don't know that each other very well. But it um, indicates that they have very, very different sympathies, which you feel is probably going to mean that they can't be as close as they might have been if they hadn't had the argument. So it's a bit sort of definitive, or it feels that way in the poem. I found out why that day, that suicide from the Empire State falling on someone's car troubled you so, and why we quarreled. War, illness, an accident, I can see you cried, but not this, what a bastard, not spring wide. I said, a man, life in his teeth, could care not much just whom he spat it on. And far beyond my laugh, we argued either side. One has a right not to be fallen on. Our second meeting, yellow you were wearing, voices of our resistance and desire. Did I divine then I must shortly run, crazy with need to fall on you, despairing? Did you bolt so before it caught our fire? Mm, that's lovely. I didn't know that poem at all. Do you want to talk a little bit, Susie, about poetry and, and its relationship with novel fiction and what well, that means to you? Well, I find it very hard to read contemporary fiction when I'm working on a novel myself, which I nearly always am. And so, um, obviously, I would need to be reading something. So I tend to read a lot of poetry and also literary criticism um, at that time. And I've, I was very taken with, the, with Berriman and all the poets of the so-called New York School. And 
not just their work, but also how they lived. And there are wonderful tales of them going on holiday with suitcases full of books and no clothes at all. And it was a sort of circle of poet professors who were treated very well in America at that time and went from having to sell encyclopedias door to door to being really treated like gods and given lots of um, quite large amounts of money and were um, on the front of important magazines and that kind of thing. And the before I sort of discovered feminism, I thought quite a lot of the women who were with those men who often wrote novels sort of whilst handling their husband's crisis and, uh, rather well. I and think that's called discovering feminism, <laughs> isn't it? Yes. And so I, women like um, Jean Stafford, particularly, who's a very, very good sh short story writer and, and wrote two novels which were good as well. And this whole sort of world of poet professors and alcoholism and... Um, jazz and that kind of thing really caught my imagination and sort of stayed there. Mm -hmm. So again, doing the reading, doing that work of building a world that was very not like your world, but there it was. You were making your map of things and possibilities. Mm. Oh, I was just going to ask, you said that thing about not reading while you write. That's interesting. And you raised that, didn't you, Lucy, uh, the f when we were talking before? I, I don't... I, because I'm always writing, I have to be reading while I'm writing. I, because I... Otherwise, what? <laughs> so I somehow managed to make a watertight wall between the reading I passionately am doing all the time and my own work. I can mm. imagine some writers that I would read and I would almost feel, probably because I didn't like it, I would think, oh, that's going to seep in. I don't, I don't want to be reading Or we that. might like it too much as well as the other... I like it. You see, I always think that's just that's just strengthening. Mm. I'm not sure I ever think I like it too much. But maybe that's because I started writing quite late, so I was already... Or at least I started writing anything any good quite late. So I was already made somehow. I, don't I do love that feeling when you're reading something very good and you stop reading because it's made you want to write something. Yeah, that's, I love that That's a lovely feeling. More than anything. Yeah. But uh, no, I think that the more you read, the... You know, you're stocking your brain. Mm. So then when you're writing something yourself, you have available, not consciously, mm. but stashed away in your memory. Um, you're kind of, you know, it, it's filed away, even if you don't really know yeah. it's there. Yeah. That if you're w trying to work out some way to describe a scene or to construct a paragraph, y you know the alternative ways of doing it because mm, yeah. you've read so many yeah. other people's yeah. solutions to those yeah. problems. Definitely, but if I wanted to have someone do something very kind for someone in a novel, I'd think of kind things that people had done for me, but I'd equally think of, yeah. you know, a time in a Saul Bellow short story where someone gives someone's children food from Burger King rather than McDonald's because they flame grill rather than fry the patties and it's more <laughs> helpful or some little indication of someone trying to do the right thing or that but thing. But I can also, I can see what the writing is helping you do there. Try to write someone doing something kind. It's going to sound like one of our Victorian novels. It's going to sound <laughs> mawkish. Yeah. You're, you're immediately looking to your writer you love to, to put some sting into it, some irony into mm. it. They keep, your, one's great writers, keep one to the mark. Be clever. Don't be, don't be obvious. Don't be, don't be mawkish. Don't and, be sentimental. And in a similar way, if someone was very kind to me, I'd remember kind episodes from books as if that had almost happened to me, like the bit in Persuasion when all her nephews and nieces are climbing on top of uh, the best, the, he's one of the best heroes. And, so, and she, <laughs> she sort of can't manage it and she yeah. doesn't know what to do and she's at her wit's end and then suddenly she feels the likeness of the children being taken off her and Captain Wentworth has just done it very yeah. kindly. And I've, I've sort of been in that situation and wondered if the person who'd taken the children off me had read that scene or not. And, <laughs> and was that going kind to of propose thing. you within the next <laughs> few weeks, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> OK, I'm going to read my loved bit of writing now, which is just the very first two paragraphs from a short story by Elizabeth Bowen, who is... One has writers that one loves enormously but can't do much for, for one. Well, for me, that's what I feel. So I have writers I, I love to read, but they don't come inside an inner circle. Right, Bowen is beside me when I write, and if I'm feeling my sentences going slack and ordinary, she, she, it's like an injection of adrenaline to read her. So this is... It's a description, actually. And you know how dull descriptions of landscape can often be. Well, she does them fabulously. And the story is called Summer Night. As the sun set, 
Its light slowly melted the landscape till everything was made of fire and glass. Released from the glare of noon, the haycocks now seemed to float on the aftergrass. Their freshness penetrated the air. In the not far distance, hills with woods up their flanks lay in light like hills in another world. It would be a pleasure of heaven to stand up there where no foot ever seemed to have trodden, on the spaces between the woods soft as powder dusted over with gold. Against those hills, the burning red rambler roses in cottage gardens along the roadside looked earthy. They were too near the eye. The road was in Ireland. The light, the air from the distance, the air of evening rushed transversely through the open sides of the car. The rims of the hood flapped, the hood's metal flame rattled as the tourer in great bounds of speed held the road's darkening magnetic centre streak. The big, shabby family car was empty, but for its small driver. Its emptiness seemed to levitate it. On its back seat, a coat slithered about and a dressing case bumped against the seat. The driver did not relax her excited touch on the wheel. Now and then, while she drove, she turned one wrist over to bring the watch worn on it into view, and she gave the mileage marked on the yellow signposts a flying, jealous, half-inadvertent look. She's great on transport, actually, Elizabeth <laughs> Bowen. She's good on aeroplanes, which often, she's writing in the 30s, 40s, 50s, are quite a new thing, but she loves, she loves speed. That's about it well. Um, Susie, you said that often, and you've already, it's come out in what you've been saying here, things you've read in books seem as real as things in your life, and you have a sort of slippage between the two in both directions. Mm. Should that make us think that reading is, can be dangerous? You know when Flaubert wrote Madame Bovary? Well, it's obvious that part of his thesis, his argument is, if you read too many silly novels, you will be silly and imagine that every man <laughs> you meet is a romantic hero and you should be passionately in love with him. And it ends very badly for Emma. Well, I think reading a lot as a teenager does make you preoccupied with what it is to be a heroine, whether you could be one, and if you were going to be one, what kind of heroine mm. you, would, mm. Mm. you would be. And quite a lot of heroines in books I like are also preoccupied with that. If you think um, we both love Henry James and that Isabel Archer is very preoccupied with yep. that in The Portrait of a Lady. I've just yep. done an introduction to The Turn of the Screw and other ghost stories, and the governess in The Turn of the Screw is obsessed almost with what kind of heroine she's going to be. She, will she be like Jane Eyre? Or um, she's got the, the children that belong to the Guardian that she's admired. She's got his firm handshake. She's living in almost the best room in his house. What's going mm. to be next mm. kind of thing? And mm. that really motivates her behavior. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think, um, I don't know if it's dangerous spending too much time thinking about yourself <laughs> as a heroine. I do like to be thanked if I remember to buy the toothpaste, so that might be <laughs> <laughs> a bad hangover from it. I don't know. Do you see what do you think? Um, I don't think I do read um, looking for people to be myself, mm. if you see what I mean. Did you once? No, 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 I don't no, think no, no, so. No, I think I've always rather, uh, as I said earlier, sort of wanted to inhabit completely different minds. Mm. And I don't write autobiography, I, f I find the word I very difficult to use, although I'm using it over and over again this afternoon, but that seems to be part different. of the exercise, that's what we're doing here. Um, so, th and I like, uh, uh, the, there's a word escapism, which is usually sort of used in a derogatory sense, but actually I think that, I can't think of a better word, but one of the things that reading does for you, whether it's fiction or non-fiction, is to take you out of your own limited life and allow you to, to be a different person, which doesn't mean that I'm then going to go back mm. into mm. my own life and think... Um, no, I, I will now become that I, person. I, I will become some sort of dashing hero. But in a deep, complicated way, all those layers, however little one thinks I am her or I am him, which is all very interesting, um, they, they become accumulations of oneself somehow. Or an awareness of different ways of being a person. Yeah. Change, and that changes mm. your awareness of yourself. It's a two-way thing, I think, isn't it? I mean, you recognise in a fictional character mm. something that you thought mm. or felt yourself, 
And that's, that's very exciting, yeah. that sort of yeah. moment yeah. of, of yeah. thinking, oh, yes, yes. yes. That's, that, I, I know yes. how that feels. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but as I said, I think it's equally exciting to think, this is completely bizarre. I don't know what it would be like to feel or think like this. And it's really rather exciting to be exploring this, mm. this consciousness, which is quite alien to me. Mm. I think we should read some things of our own. And that might bring us up to the point when we open up for questions. Shall, I, shall we do it the other way this time? So I'll start. And actually, there is a short story in my latest collection, which is called... And the short story is the title story. It's called Bad Dreams. And in it, a child is a reader. So I chose this bit to read. And she dreams something out of her book. And actually, this is... This is I... I don't always write autobiographically, but actually this dream, this thing, sort of happened to me when I was a little girl. A child woke up in the dark. She seemed to swim up into consciousness as if to a surface which she then broke through, looking around with her eyes open. At first, the darkness was implacable. She might have arrived anywhere. All that was certain was her own self lying on her side, her salty smell and her warmth, her knees pulled up to her skinny chest inside the cocoon of her brushed nylon nightdress. But as she stared into the darkness, familiar forms began to loom through it. She was where she always was when she woke up, in her own bedroom, in the top bunk, her younger brother asleep in the lower one cold night air struck her shoulders. It was strange to stare into the room with wide open eyes and feel the darkness yielding only the smallest bit as if it were pressing back against her efforts to penetrate it. Something had happened, she was sure, while she was asleep. She didn't know what it was at first, but the strong dread it had left behind didn't subside with the confusion of waking. Then she remembered that this thing had happened inside her sleep in her dream. She had dreamed something horrible and so plausible that it was vividly present as soon as she remembered it. She had dreamed that she was reading her favorite book, the one she read over and over and actually had been reading earlier that night until her mother came to turn off the light. In the dream, she had been turning its pages as usual. When Beyond the story's familiar last words, she discovered an extra section that she had never seen before. A short paragraph set on a page by itself headed Epilogue. She was an advanced reader for nine and knew about prologues and epilogues, though it didn't occur to her then that she was the author of her own dreams and must have invented this epilogue herself. It seemed so completely a found thing, alien and unanticipated, coming from outside herself against her will. And then I describe what her regular reading of Swallows and Amazons consists of. She loves the boats, although she doesn't know, never been in a boat and so on. But in the epilogue, she seemed to see the impersonal print written on the darkness in front of her eyes. John and Roger both went on to, it began in a business-like voice. Roger drowned at sea in his 20s. John suffered with a bad heart. The Blackett sisters, long illnesses, so-and-so killed in an unfortunate accident. And the litany of deaths tore jaggedly into the tissue that the book had woven, making everything lopsided and hideous. The epilogue's gloating, bland language, complacently regretful, seemed to relish catching her out in her dismay. Oh, didn't you know? So that is a... A real thing that happened in a dream of mine. Was it about Swallows and Amazons? And it was so about Swallows and Amazons, which I adored. And it, some of those words, most I had to remake the words. I couldn't remember enough of it. But the Susan, it, I think I didn't read, Susan lived to a ripe old age. That's the actual <laughs> words that occurred to me. And of course, I didn't want her to live to a ripe old age. I wanted her <laughs> to be perennially young. And yes. it's a fascinating dream. Mm. And that touches on a point that we discussed earlier, that um, very seldom do fictional characters sit down and read a book. Yes. And we've, all, we've been talking about how important yes. reading is to us and probably to most of the people mm. in this room mm. since here you are at a book event. Um, and it's an odd blank in a lot mm. of, yeah. of yeah. novels that yes. you know, 
the, the, the imagined characters aren't allowed that, uh, no. that pleasure that we no. all enjoy. I can think of a whole list of lovely exceptions to that, but you're so right, it's exceptions. Somehow it, it would be, it's because it's layered, isn't it? There's the novel and then there's the character and the character's going to open up on a novel inside the novel and then what if someone in that novel's reading a novel? It's sort of, it, it is endlessly <laughs> regressive, isn't yes. it? Yes. But, but very interesting and when writers do it, James does it actually, he's loved it lots, his, his characters often read. That's always interesting. They often read quite boring books. <laughs> the thing about the ripe old age reminds me a bit of the end of the Eve of St. Agnes as well, that I think some, a similar phrase is used, and I wondered if you had oh, that in it. the back of your mind. Or? Probably not at nine. No. I don't think I had read the Eve of St. Agnes <laughs> at nine, but I, me and Keats, we just hit upon it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it's a cliche, so that. Susie, will you read to us from Love and Fame? Yes, um, this is a, quite a serious book about grief disguised as a comedy about show business, so it goes <laughs> between the two. Um, and this scene is very influenced by um, the novelist and short story writer Elizabeth Taylor. And I particularly like the way she gathers a group of people together and has them doing different things. I was thinking of a scene in a short story where she has teenagers preparing to go out to a party and they're asking each other to put talc under their armpits and one of them puts so much on another one she feels like a piece of fish being prepared for the deep fat fryer <laughs> <laughs> and there's another scene of people on their lunch break in a uh, who work in a clothes shop or a department store where someone's grilling lamb chops and someone else is um, bleaching her moustache and various things all going on and I, I loved her sort of group scenes and I was thinking how she'd handle technology and I wanted to write a scene where an older woman was thinking how odd it is that youngsters are so obsessed with their mobile phones and I was slightly had Elizabeth Taylor in mind and it ends with the um, main character recalling a poem and wishing her life was more like the poem and she this character Jean teaches cookery to um, ex-offender young mothers so that they would give um, nutritious food to their children and babies and she's got some children and babies in her house. Her husband's recently died and she's gone back to work a bit too soon. She would not become one of those widows, abstracted and gaunt. She must be viable, enterprising, not bold exactly, that was too big a stretch, but she must try to be equal to her life. A joke of John's came at her, one he liked very much. So I was going to visit Marjorie, and I was running a little late, so I decided to take a shortcut through the cemetery. I knew there was a turning to the street about halfway down on the left-hand side, but it was getting dark, and I couldn't make out where I was. As luck would have it, I saw a fellow coming towards me. What a relief. But the funny thing was, was the way he was dressed. He had these long, flowing robes and a big black hood, a cowl, I suppose you'd call it, and his face was ever so pale, and he was carrying this sort of curved, knifey thing. <laughs> so I said to him, I wonder if you can help me. I'm on my way to visit Marjorie, and I know there's a turning to the street somewhere along here, but I can't seem to find it, and I'm wondering if you might possibly... I am death, the figure said to me. I am death. So, I shouted, I wonder if you can help me. <laughs> As the mood was odd anyway, Jean decided to let the girls have their telephones. Where was the harm? She brought the basket into the kitchen with a little ceremony, as though she was staggering under the weight of a vast drum of Quality Street at Christmas. The joy it brought them, this impromptu mobile reunion, they almost kissed her. Thank you so much, they said. They were visibly moved. She couldn't help smiling. The feelings were true. They were love feelings. So strange. Now Gwen was taking photos of her spaghetti sauce, placing the ladle at jaunty angles in the pan with her hand and slender wrists and long pink nails in the corner of the frame. The pink of the nails and the red of the sauce made for high kitsch. There was something almost Japanese about it. Gwen turned up the heat to capture the sauce mid-simmer. More photogenic, Jean supposed. It was bound to catch, but she mustn't say anything. It wouldn't be respectful. A splodge of tomato oil leapt up from the pan onto Gwen's little screen, where there was a picture of her baby dressed as a green and orange pumpkin at Halloween. <laughs> Gwen just laughed and wiped it off with a yellow lettuce leaf. She looked at the screen admiringly. Some of the pride she took in her telephone spilled over onto herself. They were just waiting for the sauce to cool now so they could box it up for home. Squeal suddenly of merriment. Cat had put her phone face down into a dish that had cheese grated into it. iPhone Parmigiana, Jean almost cried. She fetched a, a damp cloth. The girls themselves decided to put their phone back in the hall. They were sensible at heart. 
The cottage pies were lined up in two rows in the oven now, in oblong white enamel dishes with dark blue rims. They made Jean think of babies in a nursery, tucked up for the, in their after-lunch cots. There was already some colour on the forked mash, palish gold. You could see it through the glass door. Wouldn't be long now. The girls were having hot drinks while they waited. They liked a powdered low-cal hot, hot chocolate called Options, which came, it, which came in orange and peppermint flavours. Jean tried not to disapprove. She handed round a plate of biscuits. Someone made her a coffee. Lost my husband, fell into a nest... Lost my husband, fell into a vat of Nescaf. Least it was instant, Jean thought. Lost my husband, what a game of cards that was. Panto from when Eve was small. Calm yourself, she murmured, all is well. She went into the sitting room where three babies slept in their push chairs. A bigger one was lying on a coloured mat, bashing at the toys that dangled above his head. Jean asked the girls to take their break. She took one of the sleeping babies out of its strap, sat down carefully in her chair, and laid it out on her chest without it waking. She closed her eyes, their breathing gradually synchronised. Something frozen in her bones loosened slightly. The baby stirred, opened its eyes as though checking for something, and then resumed its sleep. It had such an intelligent air. Sometime later, eyes closed but not quite sleeping, she heard the girls trooping as delicately as they were able. Shh, she heard, and then shh to the shusha. Ordinarily, they had four or five conversations going at the same time. She loosened her hold on the baby so its mother could prize it off. The drop in temperature was radical without the child. Didn't even know if it was a girl or a boy or whose was it. Could have been anything. She heard the pushchairs going over the carpet in the hall, catching on the matting by the front door. Her parents had gone to India when she was 27 months old, leaving her with a grandmother for the best part of a year. It was lucky, she thought, that childhood occurred at the beginning of life. If it took place later on, no one would be able to stand it. She thought of an old poem with a man and a woman on the pavement in Marlebone, the man with bad x-rays in a folder under his arm, the doctor's heavy mahogany door with its lacy wrought iron screen and all their hopes shutting behind them once and for all, then only fear stretching down that bald street, which was long and could only end badly, and the wife's helpful arm and her foolish fond comments about how best to get them home quickly and cheaply, the tube lines, the bus numbers, she forgot the details of where they were getting back to. Fulham, was it Wimbledon? She felt the theft of such moments. That's how it should have been. Thank you, Susie. <laughs> okay, this is, um, a pass uh, this is not a typical passage from this novel. Uh, the novel is, uh, a third of it is set in the 17th century. And the, the central 20th century section is mostly set in a country house in Oxfordshire. But just for this brief episode, I've allowed some of my characters to go to Berlin. And it's November 1989, and some of you may know what's about to happen in that case. Um, and the characters you're going to meet are Nell, who is a woman in her 30s, her baby, Jemima, and she is waiting in a cafe in Berlin for her husband, Jamie, who is a news reporter who is stationed in Berlin um, to report back from there. And she has come out with her baby to, to visit him. And she's agreed to meet him in this cafe, um, but Jamie hasn't showed up, which is no surprise at all because he's deeply unreliable. Nell settled herself back in her chair Jemima, in her sling, slept and drooled between her breasts. It was peaceful. Jamie would come eventually, she supposed. When she told him she was thinking of coming out to Berlin, he'd sounded anxious. I'm working non-stop, he'd said. But then, to her surprise, because he didn't say things like this, he'd said, I do really, really miss you both. So she'd come. Time passed. Jemima stirred and snuffled and arched her tiny body. There was a spluttering noise from her lower end, and at once Nell could smell it. A woman out on the pavement was rapping at the window and shouting. The glass was thick. Nell couldn't make out what she was saying, probably wouldn't have understood anyway. Her German was rotten. The woman kept banging on the window. She looked wild. A waiter made a shooing gesture. She waved both arms in the air and jumped up and down, and then went on down the street, dancing. Nell could see her banging on other windows, still shouting. 
Other people joined her. Some sort of a demonstration, perhaps? Come, little mouse, said Nell to Jemima, picked up her big bag, so much luggage for such a tiny person, and went to the diamond. There was a changing table. She stripped Jemima to her vest and cleaned her bottom and put the used nappy in a scented bag. Why do I buy these bags, she thought. The smell is sickening. I actually prefer the smell of poo. She put the nappy in a bin and got out the new one and she and Jemima played the usual games of where's it gone and bum up and tickle tummy and all the time she was singing to her just little scraps of nursery rhyme and because they were in Berlin she began to sing the rhymes that Gertie had taught her Gertie the German au pair girl who used to look after her and would sing her the songs of her own childhood Humpty Dumpty and Schneeweiss's eye fiel von der Mauer und brach in zwei when the new nappy was on Nell played the all of Jemima game here are Jemima's feet, and here are Jemima's knees, and so on, always giving the part in question a gentle little shake, which made the baby laugh and wriggle. And then she sang Gertie's rhyme again, and this time, because she was interested to know whether something she had memorised phonetically as a sequence of meaningless sounds would make sense, now she understood at least a bit of the language. She translated it for Jemima. Humpty Dumpty, a snowy white egg, which gives it away. It's a riddle rhyme. It spoils it to begin with the answer. <laughs> Fell off the mower. Mower. Off what did Humpty Dumpty fall? Now she knew what the mad woman had been shouting. No wonder she looked arranged. Humpty Dumpty <laughs> sat on a mower. What did Humpty fall off? The wall. Die mower ist gefallen. That's what she'd yelled. Die mower ist gefallen. No wonder she was shouting and dancing. No wonder Jamie wasn't there. All fall down, wool fall down, Nell told Jemima as she poppered her into a clean red suit with a panda face on the chest. Wool fall down, she sang as she got her back into her sling. <coughs> Jemima began to wail. This wasn't right. She'd been hoping for a bottle. They walked back out into the cafe just as the kitchen door swung open and a dozen people burst through it shouting. <coughs> Nell could see they had the television on there. Three of them ran straight through the cafe and out into the street. The others were spinning between the tables and people were rising to their feet and hugging each other and shouting and kissing and they were all saying what that first mad-looking Cassandra had been saying. Die Mauer ist gefallen. A huge red-faced man hugged Nell and Jemima together and Jemima went quiet in astonishment and then began to cry louder and louder and Nell fought her way back to their table and found the bottle of formula and got it into Jemima's mouth and struggled into her own coat and got the sling back on because the world may be changed utterly but if you're looking after a baby you still have to do these things and then at last she found the dummy that she really hardly ever used and popped it into Jemima's mouth and by this time they were almost alone in the cafe but she still went up to pay but the cashier was dragging on her own coat and said something Nell couldn't follow but which was pretty easy to understand and the three of them, cashier, baby, and the serious-minded civil servant, who was at one of the great turning points of 20th century European history, in the ladies' loo, wiping shit off her daughter's bum, went out into that stirring night. <laughs> what an excellent place to finish. <laughs> Now that just goes to show what a terrible chair I am because that brings us almost up to half past. Does that mean we should stop now or can we sneakily have five minutes for questions? You tell me, Derek. One or two, One or two <laughs> questions. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you for that. And I do a Concise. Concise, short questions. Probably with a yes or no. No. <laughs> Would anybody like to ask one of those? Mm. I really love it more than I did the first time around. Um, uh, and having to reframe it through modern eyes. And I wondered how, how you managed that with your families and whether you reframed it up. Mm. Oh, well, you couldn't do that now. Or, of course, 
you know, their options are so limited or, or whether you would leave it alone and what is your feeling of lending? That's a very interesting question, yes. And, and anybody want to pick that one up? I recently uh, offered to read a friend's son a bedtime story and his bedtime story was the Steve Jobs autobiography. And uh, <laughs> the passage I was asked, w was reading, was all about his use of acid and other drugs and this little boy really looks up to me and I had this ethical dilemma and I read a little bit and then I had to say, listen Cyrus, although some people do like to take drugs and find it quite useful and mind enhancing, for a lot of people it leads to difficulty and dismay and so I don't want you to think I'm endorsing this kind of, you know, feeling completely idiotic. So you would have read Little Women sort of saying, look, some <laughs> women found complete fulfilment in devoting themselves to their absent husbands, but you don't have to do that. And were medium sized or even quite big. <laughs> And I think, read the book and talk about it. Mm. Yeah, that, which is what you're doing, obviously. Lucy, is that what you think? Yes. Yes, exactly. I think you do want to have a conversation around your, what you're reading, which, which probably happens naturally when you're reading to, yeah. with two yeah. children, with children, that they like to talk about it, don't they? So that it's quite, I think, spontaneously... This, the conversation will begin about how yeah. things were different in yeah. those days, yeah. as it were, without one having to make a big But also thing let them inhabit it as well. Yes. Let them inhabit that other possibility. OK, one more concise, quick question. Somebody had their hand up, didn't they? Oh, yes. Thank you. I don't know whether it's concise, but I'll try and make it. Um, question for any of you, all of you. Has um, your writing, or the fact that you are writers, completely and irreversibly changed the way you read? Um, or are you still able sometimes to read as yeah. you would in your pre-writing days? I mean, probably I can't re exactly remember pre-writing days. I remember long days of writing badly. But I think it must do. Uh, reading never... I, when I go to the cinema, I sit very innocently in front of the film. I, I'm very judgmental, but I'm not thinking, oh, look at the camera shot or how long that shot lasted, which my son, not that he's a filmmaker, but he always is aware of that. But I am always aware of a novel working up to a threshold. And then, because it's great... I'm over that threshold, and the book is just acting on me, along with all my awareness of how superbly it's being written. But I must say, I can't lose myself in a book where I can just see the workings. I can just see it's weak. I can just see, ah, that's botched, or, ooh, that's not good enough. So it does, but, but not to spoil, absolutely not to spoil, because past that threshold, the joy is double, almost, I would say. Yes, I agree. I think that um, very early on I realised that most extremely good books invite a more simple response than the one that they actually require. So I was aware of being sort of um, falling into the book and being taken out of myself and into it, but also very mindful of how the effects were made. But it didn't, it didn't lessen it, because I'm much more interested anyway in character and texture. In a way, it just gave me more of that. It, it took me deeper into the book, really, and it, it didn't make me believe it any more or any less, but it just um, it seemed to make the experience richer. Lucy, do you want to have a last word? <laughs> um, yes. I, I think it's not uh, because I'm a writer that I've gradually learnt to appreciate writing more. It's because I've done more and more reading, mm. which I think mm -hmm. brings us back mm -hmm. to the beginning, that actually mm. what we... Um, the better you become as a, a reader, and I don't mean that it's something that you have to kind of work at or no, something, it's pure no, pleasure, no. but just the more, the more discriminating your, your sense of what is good becomes, the, the greater the delight you get from the yes. books you read. That's a, that is the best possible way to end. <laughs> <laughs>